Hey everybody, Jesse Knox here, Beast of Burden. Um, I want to talk about a kind of a big project we've been working on the past three, four years. Um, behind me is the last remaining cedar trees on the farm. There's about four acres and I have scattered three, maybe six acres across. And I want to talk about removal of cedar trees, why it's important if you want better habitat. So back in 2020, when I was done doing habitat work at the time, I had a normal somewhat normal job. I um, went turkey hunting and I haven't gone turkey hunting in a long time. Last time I went was like 2015. I had a great time, lots of gobblers. Um, didn't get a bird, but there's a lot of gobblers. So I went back 2020 and it was a cooler year, but I didn't, I didn't hear the gobblers like I was used to. This place used to be just live of gobblers. And it was just really quiet. And I called my private lands biologist, Kevin Anderson, and go, Kevin, something's not right. Would you like to come out for a walk and look what's going on my property? He goes, yeah, sure. So we went for a walk and he said, essentially you're doing a pretty good job, but there are some things I want you to think about. You have over 40 acres of Eastern red cedar. And you might go, what's the big deal about that? That's habitat. That looks pretty bare to me. He was explaining to me that Eastern red cedars, even though it can screens are beneficial up North where you might have more hardier snows, they're beneficial. But when they're a monoculture, take over 20 plus acres, heck even just two acres, it's not conducive for habitat because you have animals pass through here, it's decent cover, but there's no browse, there's no fawning cover, there's no brooding cover, there's especially no nesting cover. So it really doesn't do much except harbor invasive species like honeysuckle and cerise less bees as well. So he suggested sign up for equip and let's shoot the cedar trees. It looks like you have native species trying to pop up. Because behind me, you know, when I was a kid, this was very low and scattered and we had I don't remember what we have, but it was really open. We had a high rabbit population. It was a lot of fun hunt. But over the years, I did notice like the fescue was even disappearing. Fescue is not great grass. You know how I stand on cool season grasses, but that's how thick the cedar trees got. They actually started shading out or cool season grasses to the point they were pretty much removed. And it just wasn't conducive anymore to habitat. They had to be removed. So seeing the difference from then when I was a kid till now as an adult, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take Kevin's advice to try to get this opened up. So we signed up for Equip. And I got approved in 2021 and I found a contractor and I, I had a contractor come do it and he used a, a skid shear because I didn't think it was feasible to cut down all these trees without getting trapped and crawling my hands and knees across 20 acres. Had a full-time job. I just didn't think it was a good idea. So I decided to hire this gentleman in Mike Roth with, um, I think it's called, I want to say Blue River Services. I'll try to leave a link to his company in this video. So I had him come out and he did a good job. He did in August, 2021. And it was so thick, like we told him don't pile it and you did the best job you could, but you could see one pile of cedar trees and it just kind of slowly moved across the landscape as he's like piling trees and trying to thin them out much as he could. They were so thick, he didn't have much of a choice. So he did that and then pretty much what was so cool, we had a great native response and we'll show you some of the response we have now, three years later. And the response was in like September, like young black eyed Susan, and some partridge peat. A lot of oaks were coming up. Oaks that were suppressed by the lack of sunlight. They're there this entire time. They just couldn't thrive due to the cedar trees shading out those oak trees. And over the years, I would just start learning how to identify invasive species like autumn olive, honeysuckle, different thistles, cerise lesbidiza, um, and species like that, and targeting those with different chemicals. Like I started just with Roundup, moved to Crossbow, went to Grazon. I started using primarily now pasture guard escort to help manage those invasive species. Because if you don't manage the stand, in a way it's some form of a clear cut. The cedar bodies you'll see are still here. We're trying to do a burn sometime this year, but uh, possibly even next spring, but I like to do it this year. Um, you're allowing sunlight to come in, which is great for your oak trees and other desirable trees and native species, shrubs. We have a lot of uh, shrubby St. John's wort. We have a lot of plums, um, dogwood coming back, black raspberries, all wonderful habitat. But the problem is, so does the invasive species. They thrive with that. So if you're gonna do something like this, you really gotta to commit to it and either get a serious cost share to help pay the contractor or pay your time and herbicides to go over this stuff and spray it. Um, when they're small, and they're easy to control. But if you let it go for three to five years, you're got to square one. Honeysuckle grows an average of foot to two foot a year. So you gotta be on top of this stuff if you wanna manage it. But I just wanna show you a comparison of what was before. And we're gonna go over here where we clear cut back in 21 and show you what it is now. Okay, this is what it looks like now. Lots of cedar trees left over the piles, but what we have here is very diverse, a lot of diversity. You can see a couple honeysuckles sticking up right there by this dead tree, um, which is the honeysuckle we cut down actually or dragged off the side. Anyway, 
Um, you can't get them all. <laughs> They're very determined, so he's got to stay on it, like I said. So if you looked at the area photograph, my neighbor had a picture of her place. <clears throat> These gnats are terrible. He's out of rain. It is terrible today. Anyway, her place borders this farm, and it showed that this, this part of the farm, which my dad bought, I think, uh, mid-2000, before he passed away. I think it's 2010 or 11 he bought this. And um, what was so unique, it was wide open. It was managed for pasture. So we have lots of clovers. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, this is terrible. Tree foils and whatnot. And so a lot of that stuff's come back up. And hopefully using growing season fires or just fire in general, we can peter this out. Fire does encourage birds for tree foil, the seed coat. So you might try to do growing season burns to help set that tree foil back. Big problem. But this is kind of cool stuff that's popped up, like this flaming sumac is really spread out. Fantastic, good cover, good food source, good browse cover for deer. Lots of different forb species, though. Um, I've seen all kinds of stuff from Black Eyed Susans, Mountain Mint, Golden Raw, Purple Milkweed, Common Milkweed. Um, I think I said Mountain Mint. Some native grass are coming back. Well, in Common Grass, you can see, let me walk over here. This grass here is actually called Deer's Tongue or Keller's Grass which my friend Mike from PA was asking, do you have a deer's tongue in your neck of the woods? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mike. And this grass has come over like crazy, which it's a little too thick for brooding cover right now. The past two years, it's been really good. This is really due for a burn, but now we have this great, nice, consistent, tall fuel source to carry a fire across the landscape. So we're gonna pause the video, pick up and back and forth and show you the differences in what we have previously and what we have now, and we'll start here. So one thing you might notice, baby cedar tree come back up. But we do have a lot of oaks coming up in this stand, which I think is just fantastic. Shrubby chain John's wort, that's some of it right there, this bush right here. Um, you can see a lot of, well, we have a very common oak tree here, it's called shingle oak. It's in the red oak family. It's mediocre for acorn production. I mean, produce a lot of acorns, it's somewhat desirable. Um, I would say red oak and white oak are definitely more desirable than um, shingle oak, but it produces a lot of mass and it's pretty dependable and you will get quite a bit of acorns. But really right now it's uh, deer browse, consistently deer browse. So even though it may not be desirable to have shingle oak across the whole landscape, a few here and there are welcome to mature and add to that. Um, and also I grow shiitake mushrooms. So having that as a, uh, a mushroom source down the road be kind of cool. But essentially it's just deer browse and you can use a growing season fire to top kill the shingle oaks. But really we also have lots of white oaks coming up too. So we all be careful. Look over here, we have a lot of trees coming up right over here in that area but so might have to do a balance of doing growing season burns and then dormant season burns and see if we can save white oaks and hope we don't top kill white oaks as i don't mind this becoming a white oak woodland again one day it might have been back in the day the 1930s and 50s photographs aerial photographs so this is wide open i can see all the wolf folks on my property on that map but on that aerial photograph but um it might have been wooded and forested before the pioneers came across who knows so something i'm trying to manage for is more oak woodland on here so but also i know fire is extremely important because we want to be able to knock back this clover and tree foil remaining brome or fescue and other invasive species on here and hopefully using growing season fires we can do that we might lose our white oaks but however it might be something we have to sacrifice for a few years until we get the desirable stance we're looking for which is native ecology here is what I kind of imagine to be like a young savanna or savanna like. Now, I'll be honest with you, those cedar tree piles we've given three years to cool. I know other um, consultants like the Land and Legacy guys, God bless them, I love what they put out. They recommend, hey, if you cut cedar trees, burn them that same year. It's going to be way easier to deal with. I did, and I'm not arguing by any means, because um, I did a burn. Well, you guys saw my videos not that long ago, back in March, early April. We did a burn, and we were able to get that fire go across those cedar trees and we're able to burn a lot of up that old residue so and i was really surprised but it really wasn't that low of a human day it was about perfect so i'm really hoping that we can encourage a good burn to break down these cedar trees and we'll see it this might be a fall burn it might be a dormant burn where this grass has now gone dormant we have a fuel source we can burn it up you might go why would you do it in the fall during bow season because i want it done primarily i want it done the deer, they've shown studies that deer are really attracted to burnt areas, and so I don't care. We just need to get this burnt and get this off the ground so we can stop. Because the thing about these cedar piles, there's two downsides. If you didn't get the invasive species inside there, which I don't blame you that you didn't, you're gonna be a harboring ground for invasive species. And number two, 
it's a great place for raccoons to den up at. So we really wanna get these things off of here so we're not attracting raccoons and we're not attracting pest species like that, especially invasive species. And also to encourage, because we have a lot of biomass on the ground. We have a lot of cedar trees on the ground. And I'll be honest with you, those cedar trees, they go up, we might lose some oak trees, we might lose some elm trees, but that's a, that is a sacrifice I'm willing to take so we can get this off the landscape. We can help encourage fire. We can help get more native ecology coming through here. Because like I said, we have some really cool stuff out here. There's a lot of different native shorter grasses out here. We have have sharp ear and brushy stuff we have cool forbs but we need to be able to remove um the cool season products like the clover the warm season legumes like the tree foil and these cool season grasses at timely burns and to help encourage that to care like i said earlier to increase that native ecology which is going to increase better deer browse better nesting brooding habitat and also oak production down the road this is so cool this is why <laughs> iowa does not have glade or glens you know, Lion Legacy or a White Tail Properties just posted a great video on restoring um, Glen sites you usually found in the Ozarks. But this reminds me of a, of a Glen. I don't think it is, but it's really neat. Before, for two years, this is all just bare soil. It was bare soil. And I think it's like a wild oat that has come up. But we also, if we walk through here carefully, there's all kinds of baby oaks and some elms coming back up. Look right here. We got some beautiful baby oaks coming back up. Which is why I'm really more determined to do some form of um, dormant burn. So we don't lose all these beautiful baby oaks. And look at them all. This has been the most encouraging part of the whole process. Um, we've been really adamant to keep invasive species under control. And, you know, we did a bunch last year. I've been doing it on top for the past two years. Still missed a few. It happens. But also want you to look over here. If I can get you to turn around, pal all that white oak and shingle oak coming up you can see just where it changes so dramatically the here we have open sunlight this kind of grassier um i can call it ecosystem i guess and then it turns to that forested edge because we don't have that sunlight now people are like well deer don't eat grass well that's not the point the point is we have a fuel source to get the fire to carry across the landscape and there are forbs in here and really importantly there's oak trees growing in here and this is not a cool season grass this is a some kind of either the native cool season grass or native warm season grass i honestly don't remember and i could be wrong in the native type it might not be but we have a fuel to carry a fire across but i'm so excited to see young oak trees and young shrubs come up and we're going to go to the favorite part of my stand here in a second this to me is just so cool this is this young stand I've seen for a long time. And when the cedar trees were removed, I was just so encouraged. So these are just young shingle oak, red oak, and white oak, and one big cottonwood in here. And to me, this is what I'm hoping this stand will look like the next 30 years. You know, it, it's gonna take a long time. I'm 30, I'll be 33 in a couple weeks. And I might be 63 when we actually finally have something that's to break home about, but that's okay. Cause we're in the, we're starting now. This is why I'm not a big fan of cedar trees. This is all bedding. There's forbs, there's oaks growing in here. This is my favorite part of this entire stand, that lone bur oak, which by the way, he might, he might lose it in this burn. It's okay. There's another tree that will take its place. There's dozens of trees I've showed you guys that can take its place. It might take 30 years to get there, but having full sunlight, being on top of the invasive species, and also doing crop tree release, even at a young stage, we can encourage that kind of tree again. Put the work in now, we might have dozens of these kind of trees scattered around here, a young wolf oak, and it might survive. If we do a dormant burn, we it might survive. Dormant birds still encourage forbs. We're looking for forbs. Because this grass, it's not great for turkey cover, it's not great for quail cover. It's decent fawning and, and, and deer cover right now. But to be honest with you, what's gonna be more impressive, we burn this off and we have more forbs, which are gonna be still good nesting, brooding, and <clears throat> fawn recruitment and just deer browse in general so we went and this to me it's so cool so we went from bald spot just clay dirt terrible say hello to that baby black locust right there and now we have some we're going to have consistent fire across this entire stand i've been wanting to burn these cedar trees the past two years and finally we had the fuel source to do it and i'm looking at the future it's not gonna be like this tomorrow but it is gonna be really exciting to have these kind of trees scattered throughout my property throughout the farm and you know we're not done here we have more to do. We have a lot of TSI to do in there. We got timber burns to do in there. We have a lot of black locusts to hack and squirt, which I've been working on the past couple of days, trying to kill those trees and keep them set back so they don't spread out here. And we get a new invasive monoculture take the cedar trees place. We don't want that. So it just, it's diligence, it's hard work, it's unpaid work. I have some CSP money, but all this in here, it's nothing to do with CSP right now. I did a little, eh. 
Yeah, actually last year we were, but it was pretty much pennies on the dollar for that particular cost year rate. Grateful I'm in the program, but that particular one was pretty bad. <laughs> 18 bucks an acre real across in July and August was like, ouch. <laughs> but we got her done, we were able to recover some of our herbicide costs. And it's not about the money, it's just about, this is our turn, this is our future. What good would it have done to leave the cedar trees here? Like, oh, it'll be better than it is now. Why would you say that? Look what we have coming up. Look behind me, or over here. We got oaks and sumac and, you know, some elm, but that's browse. Look at that young little black guy, Susan, trying to grow underneath this shingle oak right here. There's a future. Those cedar trees were not a future. We don't have a market. It's not a, unfortunately, it's a tree species that is an indicator that just having fire here for a long time. I'm just listening to Wild Turkey Science and they're interviewing a couple of biologists from South Dakota and they're considering Eastern Red Sea to be invasive. And it's a challenge. I understand why some guys don't want to cut them down because it's like, they're pretty, yeah. And also number two, you have a lot of work to do. But if you have a fire regime and the fire can help set back a lot of invasive species and encourage acorn production or acorn cracking from the heat and forbs, to me, that's way, way, way more productive to have a future for the next generation of people who are in this place and for wild turkey, for quail, for woodcock, for pheasant, for deer, the next generation. That's why I sheared these cedar trees. That's why I went so hard at it. There's a lot of work to be done that had to be done for the future. And I'm okay with burning them up. I return the soil back to earth for the next crop, whatever that might be. So guys, I hope this gave you something to think about. Please contact your private land volunteers, your foresters, if you're considering undertaking like this. There's a good time to sign up for cost share, for CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, EQIP, to help you get the funding you need to do projects like this. If you have a market for cedar trees, talk to contractors to help harvest those cedar trees. Some places there's a decent market. Some places up here, nobody wants them. So I'd rather work hard, cutting them down, burning them, and trying to make a buck every time in my life. Instead, I can be making, investing my time and energy for a better future for the next generation. It's our turn right now. What are you going to do with your turn?